Hello, everyone. I'm Joseph Jaraputo, the publisher and editorial director of Global Finance. Welcome to our sub-custody roundtable. Regular readers know we have conducted many live roundtables. This event will be a virtual roundtable. We expect the roundtable to last about an hour. Based on pre-interviews with the participants, we've created an agenda of five questions. Each of the participants will have an opportunity to take the lead on responding to a question. Then the others will join in the discussion. We have four partic participants today whom I will introduce now. Julia Ramahanyi of Unicredit is joining us from Budapest. Kashif Dar at First Abu Dhabi Bank is coming to us from Abu Dhabi. Lloyd Sebastian at CIBC Mellon is joining from Toronto. And finally, Bill Gladstone at Society General of Security Services is in London. You'll find bios of each of our participants elsewhere on this posting. Now I'll pose the first question and ask Julia to begin the discussion. We have all been affected in our personal and professional lives by COVID-19. How is it impacting your business? Were there any developments unique to your region? Julia? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for inviting for the first uh, virtual global finance roundtable. I'm very honored to represent Unicredit here and provide you an update uh, what has been done in our region, in, in our industry, and how COVID has impacted uh, us all across the world. So obviously the past few months this have been characterized as significant uh, changes in our daily personal and professional lives which also at the same time brought many new innovative ideas and opportunities for the industry to work, it, to work in a much more efficient uh, environment and in a much more efficient way. Unicredit Group, which is headquartered in Italy, was uh, one of the most impacted countries in the EU uh, and obviously uh, have been able to provide already in a very uh, early stage of the pandemic very strict guidelines and introduced travel bans at the very, very early stage of the pandemic in the first wave. Transferring to the home office uh, driven by Unicredit Group was very smoothly managed. Uh, the safety of our clients and obviously our colleagues were the number one priority across all the locations. So the group have uh, provided all necessary tools which were needed in order to smoothly transfer to the new working environment, which was the full home office uh, environment, where it was needed uh, based on the level of the pandemic in each and uh, every country. Obviously, the home office was not something new for Unicredit, so we have been already uh, working in such an environment, but not in that extent, but at least we already had the culture how to work and already had implemented processes, already had implemented IT security measures to ensure that it is working uh, properly. I think it is also important to state that the, the past months has also showed that the entire industry was quite well prepared uh, with its BCPs, uh, how to transfer in such a short period of time to, full, um, to a full home office uh, environment. And this gives also the opportunity to show that we have very well working uh, processes, operational IT security controls, which allowed the industry to work remotely in a very, very smooth way uh, in the past months. Uh, obviously, during this period of time, operational uh, and IT security controls was one of those top priorities in our agenda which we have to also uh, take into consideration when all the colleagues in the operation were transferred to the new home uh, office environment. Uh, but they had to only implement those uh, processes that were already in place. They just had to get in uh, favor, uh, get uh, um, to know how to, to work in, in such an environment. Uh, Unicredit Group already had, uh, during the Transfer 2019 plan, a, a robust uh, digitalization plan, which was accelerating uh, during this period of time. Uh, and we implemented many new automated processes in the past few weeks, uh, past few months, in order to ensure that we are only limiting uh, the local, uh, the, the office presence as low as, as possible in these countries. 
so for example, in our region, in our region, what was very, very important is the introduction of uh, some of the electronic signatures in some processes. Also uh, in uh, um, Serbia and Croatia, uh, we are able to submit uh, documentation in a uh, digital form. Or in Bulgaria, we have uh, implemented the um, electronic uh, proxy voting environment. I think these are all changes that are absolute new opportunities and also giving um, uh, already a, a, a ground for further development, how we can further digitalize and how we can further automate uh, processes in the region. So this uh, is a momentum for the industry in order to further develop and in order to, to make sure that we are working in a much a higher automated level and a much more efficient way. So I think it's important that we are not stopping here and that we are keeping these well working processes even if when the pandemic will be over. And this is what we have to make sure all across the world that we are keep lobbying, let it be with the regulators, let it be with the local infrastructure, to accelerate the digital transformation all across the value chain end to end uh, from the investors to, uh, till the CSD through the um, uh, sub custodian and custodian chain. So uh, the past month is proof that it can work. So I think we just need to make sure that we continue this path. So I still see uh, this is a positive opportunity for the industry to, to, to further uh, transform uh, to a more digital world. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to comment on, on uh, your experiences? I'd like to pick up on a couple of points that Julia mentioned there and, and completely agree. Um, such in our security services is, um, is very present across both Western Europe, but also Eastern Europe um, and North and Central Africa. And, and it's these emerging and frontier markets where historically we, we are challenged by the uh, heavy uh, necessity for, for physical documents, now whether that's um, um, power, power of attorney or, or tax certificates. Um, and I completely agree with Julia. I think this is one of the positives that we have to take from this um, is that this has forced us to adapt um, and to accept digital copies of documentation um, because in this environment it's very difficult for documents to be notarized and for, um, for uh, legal agreements etc to be executed in person and more and more um, different legislations and um, legal jurisdictions are accepting digital um, certificates um, but uh, this really does just demonstrate to some of the more emerging and frontier markets as I said that it can work um, whilst there have been temporary concessions granted I think it's really important as Julia said uh, that we lobby and we work together um, as, as market participants to to lobby the infrastructure and, and the uh, legislators to make more permanent changes going forward. Okay. All right, thank you. Anyone else? If I could add something from a Canadian point of view, I think uh, we had already started uh, a digitalizing operational footprint by multi locations for some time. Uh, but I think with the COVID, the, the challenge was largely uh, mobilizing people to a work from home environment. I mean, if I look back, uh, starting in March, early March, we were up at a 50% of the staff working from home, moved towards uh, mid-March to a 75% and come April, 98%. But these were some of those challenges one had to sort of work through uh, in a unique way of shifting staff uh, to, to, work from, to, to, to be in a work from home environment. The other point, as Julia and, and, and Stuart has mentioned, is very similar. The wet signatures versus the electronic signatures was something that we have to get custom and, and to adapt to. And I would also sort of say that one of the other challenges we found, which we overcome uh, uh, relatively uh, in, in a cohesive fashion, was when the uh, CSD uh, closed its window for physical securities and we had to work with the transfer agent community to do, have some form of a methodology to have the signature, the certificate rather re-registered and to work through the process. So I think that's probably some of the things come to my mind from a Canadian point of view. Okay, anyone else? I'd just like to add from a, uh, I represent a direct custody business in the Middle East and some of the challenges that have been outlined very much applicable to our region as well. 
Um, it's, you know, in times like this, as the other panelists have, have referenced, it is an opportunity to press forward and actually action change that we have been lobbying for many years. And I think one of the successes that we had in the United Arab Emirates was specifically with e-signatures has been uh, highlighted as one of the issues of the requirement for physical wetting signatures. Um, and clearly what, what's the requirement here is regulatory change and regulatory change working in conjunction with technology. And we were at first Abu Dhabi Bank, we were able to implement a technology platform, e-signature, which was vetted and by our local regulators. And now we've, able, we've been able to have documents accepted from a regulatory perspective in, in a single jurisdiction of UAE. But I think that's a good example of where technology and regulation working hand in hand has enabled us to move forward the market in a specific example, which we look to broaden uh, more widely. Okay, um, we're going to move on to the next question, which which uh, um, we, we've already got into uh, each of you in, in, in to some degree. And and uh, Kashif, I'm going to ask you to continue. Uh, what have you learned for better or worse during the pandemic that will change the way you and markets operate in the future? I think this has been such a transformational phase for everyone, not just from a business perspective, but also from a personal perspective. And I genuinely feel that the future has been drawn to the present. I think that many of the technolo technological uh, facilities that we have available are now been accelerated and integrated into our working lives. And clearly our working practices have changed dramatically. If I talk about the region which I represent, which is the Middle East, Working from home and flexible working practices were, were not particularly predominant, but of course that has all changed over the last six to eight months and now uh, our bank is almost entirely now working remotely from home. And so clearly the working practices from a professional perspective have completely transformed. Uh, how does that, how do we learn from that? Or what impact does that have? Well. From, from a business perspective, it's clearly adapt, it's changed the way that we interact. Some for the good, some perhaps not so positive, but certainly what we find is that actually the adoption of video technology has enabled us to, to have more frequent, perhaps more meaningful uh, interactions with our clients. We have clients that are based in uh, multiple geographies, multiple countries, and historically, of course, we've visited them physically, and that requires planning, that requires expense. But throughout this period for our existing clients, we've found that it's far more efficient. We've been able to have far more, I would say, frequent contact with them in a more meaningful way through this technology. I think clearly there's some limitations there as well. So for, for new business expansion, it's much harder to engage with new clients uh, without physical meetings. So there's, of course, some limitations to the technology. So, so the working practices have most definitely transformed through this period. From a, um, fr from a market infrastructure perspective, we've seen, as, as mentioned by the other, uh, by the other members, that the, the infrastructure themselves, the exchanges and the depositories, their business continuity processes have very much stood up to the test. So they have been proved to be robust. I think that's the case in the Middle East region and across the world. So I think that is a real positive that has come out of this. But there are also clearly um, areas where the, the infrastructure, the market infrastructures need to, to adapt. In, in the Middle East region, a number of the depositories still have um, dedicated terminals for trade confirmations with dedicated lines from the market participants to the depositories. That is not compatible with remote working and with flexible working practices. So there are most definitely some infrastructure changes that are going to be required to adapt to this new environment that we now face. Um, and, and, and some of our, the markets in our region have already 
taken steps towards this. I think Saudi Arabia is a good example where there has been a, 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 a tremendous shift in what was a relatively antiquated infrastructure moving now towards uh, in, implementing uh, swift technology communications, which then can interact with ourselves as a market participant, where we adopt from a custody platform perspective, web-based platforms, uh, which can be used remotely. So, so, so I think that is one area which, uh, which, which certainly will change, and we're seeing change from, from, a, from a market perspective in our region. I think a couple of other uh, <clears throat> key areas um, which have had massive change are the, the, the holding of annual general meetings. So regulation, particularly in our part of the world, uh, requires physical meetings historically, and then the participation of voting also is required from a, uh, a physical presence. Um, we're, we're now seeing the adoption of technology and the change in regulation to allow virtual uh, virtual meetings, and First Abu Dhabi Bank um, conducted the first virtual meeting in, in the UAE. And so certainly I see that those developments will continue to occur. Um, I, I think an interesting development has also been that, you know, whilst I said that it hasn't, it's not conducive towards new business, uh, we've seen that virtual due diligence and virtual meetings have now, we've conducted a number of those now. So the working practices can obviously continue, need to adapt to the requirements of the industry. And so we found effective ways of ensuring that those practices continue virtually. And, and, and I think that's, that, is, that is certainly something that's going to continue in the future. All right. Yes, thank you. Uh, does anyone else uh, uh, want to comment on uh, what changes the pandemic has wrought? Uh, if I could, uh, I think uh, picking up on the comment on the virtual meetings, We've been at CIBC Mellon also seeing the increased appetite for virtual due diligence by clients. And furthermore, I'm also seeing that uh, we would very much begin to see collective due diligences by in, in the subcustody space, where a group of clients may come together and we can start talking about the common themes like risk compliance, market updates. Uh, at, at a collective level as opposed to a client by client level to have this meeting. So I think, you know, that's that's picking up momentum. And at CIBC Mellon also, we have learned through this process that do we need 100% occupancy in physical premises, right? And uh, that's something which came out very uh, loud and clear through the process. We can work remotely and still we can have more hoteling as things become available to clients, uh, available in the uh, after the after the pandemic is over, is some some of the stuff that we've been sort of thinking about. If I may also add something, so I think uh, today environment showed that we became really borderless, right? So how this virtual roundtable could be organized in such an efficient way as it is now, having people from Canada, from uh, New York, from uh, Abu Dhabi or from the UK, I am in Budapest. So how could this be uh, be uh, organized more efficiently like today? So I think this is the opportunity that we have to also take into consideration when we are organizing events where industry is sharing ideas, know-how, also knowledge and how we are pro uh, proceeding going forward, that we have much broader scale, much broader opportunities to discuss uh, and learn also how different uh, processes are managed in different areas. Uh, at the same time, I also agree with what was said that uh, developing new relationships, this is something we still need to learn, whether it's possible virtually or not, it's very difficult. So I still see that whenever the pandemic is over, the, the physical presence of uh, of our colleagues uh, will be an important uh, element of our daily business activity and meeting with clients is still going to be something which is very personalized and very important part uh, of our business when we are building a relationship, trusting our assets to other sub custodian banks or also conducting due diligence visits. Yes, currently we all do virtually. At the same time, we still need to test how it will be uh, assessed by the regulator 
that after a certain period of time, I'm sure that they will also require to check physically whether certain processes are in a way as it is presented in a virtual environment. Okay. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, and I, naturally following on from that, I think the way that we are interacting with, with our, our clients and partners, um, but also interacting with each other, because internal relationships are, are exceptionally important in to ensure that we deliver the high level of service to our clients. So I think what we're missing, and this is very difficult to quantify, um, are the elevated conversations on the way to a meeting or, you know, grabbing a coffee and having that chance um, uh, interaction with a colleague that you haven't seen for, for weeks. Um, and what comes out of that, and I think it's very difficult to, to quantify, as I said, what the impact of that is, is going to be, but it's, it is a very different way of working. And I wonder if we're going to be able to, in this current environment, um, to, um, as an industry, to, to, to be as, I guess, um, you know, forward thinking and come up with these ideas, these great ideas that we have in those chance, you know, uh, meetings in the, in the corridors to, to really drive um, for, for, for new ideas and, and um, you know, new products. Um, so it's, it's a challenging environment. Um, I, I think we, if we look at the reason why um, our clients come and do on-site due diligence, it's not to go and sit in a room and, and, and watch a presentation about about risk or um, about what's happening in the market and updates on the market. No, it's it's to come and, and speak to people and get a feel for how the office environment is. Is it is it disorganized? Are there bits of paper lying everywhere? And um, and to be able to go and have, have demonstrations and, and look at their accounts. Now, clearly, in this environment, I don't know. I mean, uh, just picking a number, I mean, 80 percent of people would be working from home. So what are you going there to see? Um, and, and so it really, I guess, questions the value of an on-site if we're all decentralized and we're not going to be in the office that a client is coming to visit or that our operations are um, primarily working from home. You know, are they, is there the point um, um, to have that on-site? So these are all very interesting questions and, um, and the discussions our clients need to have with their own regulators as to what's, you know, what is the minimum they need to do to, to meet the requirements, their fiduciary requirements towards their, their underlying clients. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Lloyd Sebastian to begin the discussion of our next question. Many markets experience high volatility in the early days of the pandemic. The coming U.S. election and possible second and third waves of infection around the world may bring volatility back. Will subcustodians and other market players be prepared? What may we expect? So, as you very clearly said, uh, I mean, in, in March, April, we did see the spike in volatility and uh, we, we managed through that. I'm, I'm not just speaking for CIBC Mellon, but I think globally it's, it's a very fair comment to make that uh, we as uh, market participants, sub-custodians, global custodians did make sure that things did get done. We did have good collaboration uh, within uh, the market participants, be, be the CSDs with, uh, or the ICSDs with, with the extended deadlines where it had to, and where he had to shift around into, into accommodate for post-trade settlements and, and how we manage them. Uh, at CIBC Mellon, again, with the, um, uh, the environment I, I described earlier in terms of the working from home, uh, the ability to manage workflow between one member to the other, and more importantly, keeping our clients informed. Whenever we had such spikes or challenges, whether it be at the local market or anything otherwise, so that the client was aware of it in terms of um, actual settlements, there are challenges at the depository level, we got to work through that. Uh, striking NAVs, we might have challenges with uh, market prices coming in uh, from different vending providers. So I think you know, it is absolutely an important thing that we had to do was to keep your clients informed engaged so that they understood the challenges that their provider is going through and 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 they they had a element of empathy because they themselves were going through the same thing as well now if you shift back or shift forward <laughs> and look into uh the the uh, u.s elections coming up maybe the second or the third wave of the pandemic coming in it's going to be a double-edged sword we are walking here because U.S. elections per se might be just a volume volatility issue, which we might have learned so much from our lessons learned from uh, March, April, May, that we'll be able to sort of uh, include them into our model through the right technology, 
uh, right workflow management. We, we will sort of get through that, but we should not forget now, alongside that's happening, we could potentially could have staff not being available for the second or the third day, and how are we going to manage through that? Here it comes into a lot of planning that we have to do is how much we can leverage between one team to the other team uh, internally to look through that. And more importantly, to work with the uh, local market uh, service providers, whether it be the CSD or other counterparties in, in enhancing the element of communication to work through the flows. To me, if you ask me how we will uh, manage the incremental volatility in the upcoming months, it's through a collaborative, cohesive way within the market participants and also an engaged communication protocol within our clients. And more importantly, keep our staff members engaged in every step of the way because we got to go through different moving, moving uh, uh, components as part of this equation. So that's the way I would see that uh, the upcoming volatility, if any, would, would uh, come into intuition as to how we handle that. Would anyone else like to comment on this section, on this question? I would just add one thing that I think uh, already in the first wave, we saw quite a big volatility in the markets and huge volumes in, in, the, in the markets. At least in the CE region in Austria, we did not, uh, we did not uh, face any difficulty to manage uh, higher volumes due to some of the markets we are very much uh, STP based and, and uh, very much automated. So from my point of view, in C region and Austria, we are not uh, expecting any problems. If the major infrastructures are well working, we don't see major uh, issues uh, going forward to manage um, uh, high volumes uh, if they are coming. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I guess just to add a, a couple, a little bit to that. I think it's um, it, we demonstrated as an industry that we we reacted very quickly and very well um, to to being um, essentially sent home <laughs> to being sent home to continue business. I think um, there was largely without um, huge um, you know huge impact or repercussions. I think what is important, um, and again that's something that Julia touched on, is the market infrastructure. Um, I think during this crisis there have been. Two, I'm not going to mention them by name, but there have been two infrastructure with which have fallen over, um, and it and it has caused um, a tremendous um, impact across all the, the participants in in those markets or that were connecting to that those platforms. So that I think uh, it, it drives the the need for us as um, as intermediaries, financial intermediaries, um, and providers um, who are uh, the voice of our our. Um, our clients in in the markets that we operate, that we have to have to work with them at local infrastructure and make sure that they have plans. You know that their plans work and and what we should be doing as market participants in the event that it falls over. Um, the other thing I think which we really need to consider is uh, the um, uh, systemic risk where multiple banks um, are have outsourced or offshored their operations to key markets. Now, if those markets uh, as a single market where there is huge amount of offshoring um, uh, are affected more than um, or grossly more than other, another country, um, that's going to have a huge impact across multiple markets by very large financial institutions. Um, so it's something I think we need to consider. I think um, diversification of, of risk and where we have major operation centers, um, I think, is something that we, we all need to think about to ensure that. Uh, you know, if if there is a market which has a um, severe lockdown um, imposed at a very short notice, that we are we're prepared for that, um, and uh, and that it doesn't have a huge repercussion across uh, the global markets. Okay. All right. I would just add to that actually that uh, I think it's a testament to our industry that uh, in in such trying circumstances, I think the general feedback that I've had. And, not just from the Middle East region, but from beyond, is, is that market participants have worked together and have been successful in ensuring smooth operation in, in exceptionally um, difficult circumstances. And I've certainly been aware of a number of examples where both regulators and market participants and intermediaries have worked together to ensure that continues. 
uh, so, so, so I think that's testament to the flexibility and the cooperation that we see in our industry. I think to pick up on Stuart's point in terms of offshoring, um, I, I actually, I've, I've had a number of conversations around this already, and I think that whilst there has been a big trend toward offshoring over a long period of time in our industry, uh, I, I actually think that's now going to continue even further because uh, offshoring and remote working now becomes almost location the way that we work now becomes almost location agnostic. So there's a number of functions, to some extent, even client service functions. Um, there's now talk around, do they need to be located in a specific region? Not only should they be working from home, but can they be working from other countries? For, for, from, from my perspective, running a regional business, that actually adds to the talent pool that's available to me because I can recruit from across multiple different countries in different locations where, and there's not that requirement to centralize people where we have offices in the region. So I think there's a number of interesting possibilities that come out of this. Um, and I think we're just only seeing the beginnings of that right now. Okay. All right, good. Thank you very much. Um, and now our final question, which we'll turn over to Lloyd uh, to lead. Yeah. What does the future look like for subcustodians uh, in general and subcustodians in your region? Uh, I mean, if I was to wear my uh, Canadian hat and talk about that as a market, it's been very stable in Canada for the subcustodians. That it's it's uh, based on number of uh, 20 years ago, we had uh, domestic banks coming out of the custody business and uh, that kind of brought some consolidation into the marketplace itself. But look through the future uh, with the um, uh, asset segregation risk and uh, the appetite to enter markets with uh, incremental uh, size and scale. I probably think that uh, both from a North American perspective, we could uh, we hear about this, but hadn't materialized much. That could be one or two significantly large sub uh, global custodians wanting a self-clearing type of uh, arrangement where they would have uh, a direct relationship with the local CSD. This could apply to the global investment banks as well to some extent. Uh, based on size and scale again. I also would tend to think um, the account operator model that we tend to hear now and then in the global marketplace, where uh, ICST or some elite uh, global custodian wants to maintain uh, uh, a direct contractual relationship with the uh, CSD and turn the role of a sub-custodian into a utility operator. Although it's been spoken about, haven't taken momentum, but in light of the current pandemic, and also some of the risk issues. Maybe there's a possibility that particular thought process can come into play as we sort of move in uh, longer term into, into the sub-custody arena uh, from this region and predominantly from a Canadian point of view. Uh, in the Canadian sense as well, I think uh, one of the things uh, we've been uh, seeing is that uh, our CSD is going into a new technology platform through trade modernization. Uh, aligning itself with uh, uh, a technology which would be a lot more swift compliant. So we tend to think that would filter back into the sub-custodians and we might be able to sort of uh, have a lot more swift proficiency on the corporate action type of messages back into our intermediary clientele who are global custodians and global financial, global investment banks. I also tend to think that uh, as a market, maybe that uh, with, with, the, with the regulatory structure that we have, uh, more, more market standards would come into play where cohesively market participants might be working through the path of uh, corporate actions uh, on, on the Canadian front largely per se. Uh, on the Canadian front, I think uh, the payment, uh, the Canada payment uh, structure is also going into a trade modernization project from Q4 2021. That's going to be seeing a lot more infrastructure efficiencies and uh, more real time uh, payment processing uh, on, on large value uh, uh, cash items through the through the Canadian Payment Association. So there are a few things put together. We would see the, the market moving ahead uh, from an infrastructure point of view. And there could be potential for uh, the maybe some entries in the marketplace in the form of self-clearing or in the account oper operator model concepts. That's what I do see from a sub-custodian point of view in Canadian context. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? I just want to make one point. Um, I've, I've skipped a question. 
my only job on this whole thing is to read the question in order. And I missed that, but we'll come back, okay? It, we'll look at the future first, okay? Yes. If I might add to Lloyd's point there, I think that you know, what does the future hold for subcustodians in, in, in our region? Well, my region is the Middle East, um, and this region has been dominated by international banks providing uh, subcustody. I think it's interesting to test uh, the commitment of international banks to what is effectively an emerging market region and not their home territory. Of course, in, in times of crisis, economic crisis like the one we're in now, it, it tests the commitment of um, all participants. And when we've seen that a number of international banks have looked to retreat back to their core markets. So, of course, if, if in, a, in an emerging market where you have a limited number of players, if one of those significant players uh, retreats, then it has a big impact on the infrastructure. So I think that's uh, an area which will be of particular interest uh, to watch how that, that plays out. Um, I think secondly, in terms of the future of subcustody, again, as mentioned by Lloyd, uh, th there are a number of interesting developments that are happening in the subcustody market. Um, direct access to markets from global custodians is, is definitely something that we hear uh, a number of large participants talking about. Also, the introduction of um, DLT and blockchain is something that has been discussed in quite some detail in, in, in some of the Middle Eastern markets. And to some extent, while the Middle Eastern markets are clearly emerging markets and perhaps are not as advanced as some of the other more developed markets, it's, it's likely going to be easier to adopt disruptive technology such as DLT or subcustody in markets where the infrastructure is not as well developed and not as large. Um, so, so we've seen a number of the market participants, a number of the depositories and exchanges exploring the, the adoption of DLT. And it wouldn't surprise me if an emerging market region like the Middle East perhaps leads the way in some of these areas going forward in self-custody. Um, I also think another interesting possibly final point I'd make is that um, the Middle East is made up of a number of relatively similar capital markets um, which have their own depositories and their own market practices but generally speaking the global or I would say the international investors look at the Middle East as one uh, marketplace from their perspective. So there is a dichotomy there where from the regional perspective that each market has its own individuality but from an external foreign perspective, investment perspective, they look at it as one, one block uh, of countries. So I do think there is an opportunity here for something similar to a TT, T2S style of cooperation. I don't think that we'll see a merger of depositories exchanges in the region, but I think there is definitely scope to, to, to look at ways of collaboration and look at ways to use technology to create a T2S-like infrastructure because the markets, the emerging markets like all over the world require foreign investment to maintain their economies. And there are big changes happening in the region to attract that. And I think looking forward with the introduction of technology and looking at what's happened in other parts of the world, a structure similar to that is something that I could see happening in the future. Okay. All right. Anyone else on future expectations? If I may also uh, comment from Central Eastern Europe and Austria point of view. So I think uh, surely uh, our subcustodian business will be much higher automated and less paper based in the future. I'm expecting also that leading platforms will emerge from this crisis and uh, with a new organization of flexibility and agility, and we would have a more streamlined operational processes. This has been already started with the numerous uh, regula regulatory initiatives uh, which are driving us uh, and also forcing the industry to streamline, harmonize the processes like corporate action processing or dividend payment processing, whereby uh, this can only be reached if we are collaborating in a much 
stronger way. Uh, there is a very high competition in the region, uh, which definitely will continue to stay. But in certain areas, we definitely need to collaborate much more. What I mean in this is that uh, common utilities, IT utilities, could be something whereby uh, regional players can think uh, how uh, they can better collaborate in order to leverage or make it more efficient when it comes to new regulatory uh, requirements to be implemented in common platforms that we may use in a region or across uh, the industry as, as in general. So I see more collaboration in this respect, uh, but keeping uh, the, the strong competition in the region. Okay. And I guess just to finish up then, uh, on that question, I think, yeah, that we're absolutely seeing an acceleration of the drive towards um, more digital solutions. Um, taking uh, Czech Republic as, as an example where, where we are a, a local custodian, um, we're heavily involved with the implementation of uh, a distributed ledger um, uh, in part to, to satisfy the, um, the requirements from um, uh, SRD2. Um, and that should be up and running, hopefully, by I think uh, Q2, Q3 next year. But again, it's just facilitating the, the movement of, of, of flow of, of information right through to, to, the, uh, to the issuer. Um, I think I see other markets in Tunisia where we're present, where the, the, the local CSD um, was working on very um, um, outdated infrastructure and they, the acceleration of the, the new CSD platform, which we've heavily been lobbying for them to implement, has um, um, is now in place. So there are absolutely uh, positives to come out of this and, and hopefully we'll continue to see that acceleration. Um, I think when we, if we look at actually into the market, obviously behind all of this, there are companies that are operating um, and, and running and I think they will obviously be under a lot of uh, stress um, and so I, I hope that this doesn't have, you know, the, the global situation doesn't have that negative effect on, on the capital markets where it does become stagnant because, you know, there, there won't be as many, many listings or IPOs. I really hope that that isn't the case. And we, we have people that are businesses that are taking advantage of the situation and whether that's to produce, you know, face masks um, or, or other industries um, that will emerge from this um, and that, that it will be it will be positive. All right, thank you. Stuart, stay right there. We're going to come back to uh, the regulatory question. Uh, uh, how are you coping with the current regulatory environment? Uh, has it been impacted by COVID-19? And do you anticipate regulatory changes in reaction to COVID-19? Um, uh, you know, we've, we, as, as the industry, I think, has been uh, having to continue um, with the implementation of, of um, new regulations. Um, obviously, we we've implemented SRD2 um, whilst being in this situation even though I think everyone was lobbying for that to be postponed that was implemented um, it's it is it has been challenging I don't think it's COVID related I think it's, it just has been challenging because of local interpretation and adaptation and implementation of that the the regulations into law and then obviously how the local market infrastructure reacts to that because it, it is demanding you know, a lot of the flow of a lot of information um, requires um, us as intermediaries to, to be able to react to that but also the infrastructure and CSDs and we, we're seeing both in emerging and, and mature markets um, you know very different pace that, that is being implemented even though it's come into law that it's being implemented um, taking some Western European market as an example the, you know the meeting season is, starts um, next year and we're still waiting for the you know the pricing of how they're going to be pricing the requests for information and, and, and managing that um, and then we have other markets in Eastern Europe where it is implemented and everything you know it's fine but we're, you know, and they're ready so I think there has been um, quite a lot of difference and it's caused quite a lot of confusion with our clients as to the expectations for the underlying investors um, and what's going to be required of them and, and any associated costs with that. Um, I think we, well, I don't know if you call them regulation, you know, regulatory changes, but we've definitely seen some some tax, some changes to tax in the in this period. Um, I think a lot of that will be driven by um, countries who, obviously, um, need to be shoring up, you know, their 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 uh, their purses um, uh, in, in dealing with this this crisis. And so, I think we're seeing. And we are seeing changes to the to tax and how that's that's applied, whether that's from you know ta double taxation treaties, 
or, or the ability to um, to receive relief at source, essentially making it harder for for foreign um, investors to um, to get that tax back. Um, so there are there are associated impacts. Um, um, CSDR two has obviously been postponed um, to 2022. Um, but I would hope that we will see some change, as I think we've all mentioned earlier on in this in this roundtable. We will see some change, whether it's regulatory or um, 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 passing new laws, to make it easier um, for foreign and cross-border investment into these markets in an environment um, where it isn't as easy to um, to produce physical documents uh, or send physical documents out. So I really hope it's it's driving, it's going to drive change, and, and we should play a part in in, in driving that change. Okay. Anyone else on on? Uh, if I may add, add more of a broader comment. Uh, I mean, as financial institutions, we have seen some level of flexibility by the regulators while they were dealing with the volatilities, and so this could be even uh, by delayed implementation of certain regulatory measures and or certain type of uh, reporting monitoring. The regulators have taken more of a. Uh, uh, Kind of a, a scale down view in terms of certain certain aspects of control and oversight, just right in the middle of it. And uh, to some of the points that Stuart made as well, I think locally looking through the central banks' uh, rate cuts uh, have seen some some way of stimulation to the economy, but at the same time, it's more of a flexibility demonstrated to stimulate number of things going on in the market. But if you start looking at the tax authorities, very similar to to Stuart's comment here, it's that it's it's, it's more of something that we also found in the Canadian marketplace on. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a market where taxes are withheld at source and uh, the uh, tax reclaims of uh, wet signatures versus actual paper, electronic signatures, letters of exemptions, how they're going to be handled. So there were some temporary reliefs that were given by the tax authorities just on that front. But as we move through this, I would tend to think that things would get back to normal, but uh, a little bit more in a slower space, subject to whatever goes on with the pandemic and and what's next to come will determine the 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 regulators uh, actionable items as to how they move forward uh, in the today's market. Okay. Anyone else? If I may, um, so so of course we did see a number of regulatory shifts. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, primarily to facilitate some of the key activities in, in, in the capital markets here in the Middle East. One I've already mentioned in terms of um, annual general meetings uh, where the regulation historically would not allow for virtual meetings. There was an adoption and a, and a change in the regulation to allow for virtual meetings. Unfortunately, we, we've seen a, a, a step back from that uh, in our region in a number of markets, which um, is, is something that we're lo lobbying against. Uh, but, but I would say on a more general note that I, th I think certainly in our, my region of the Middle East, it's still perhaps too early for um, specific regulatory change resulting directly from, from the current crisis. What we do see in the Middle East, though, and we've seen this over, over a number of years since for the last four or five years, is there has been huge regulatory uh, transformation, I would say. The, the, the regional markets here had historically uh, been very comfortable from petrodollars, but given the, uh, the, the dip of oil prices from a high of around 120 down to sub $30, um, they, the regional markets have been looking to, a, very much looking to attract foreign investment. The markets like Saudi Arabia, where he, they, which were historically almost uh, barred to foreign investment, have dramatically changed the regulation to introduce and make it easier for foreign investment to flow into the market. So, so we're seeing huge changes from a regulatory perspective for, for foreign investment. Um, into the markets. Obviously, if you want to attract foreign investment, then the underlying market mechanics and the underlying regulatory regime needs to uh, change as well. So we've seen big changes in things like bankruptcy law, 
uh, changes to ensure greater investor protection. Um, and, th and that has spread th throughout the region of the Middle East. I think perhaps starting with, with Saudi Arabia, but we've seen it across all the region. And, and, and I expect that pace of regulatory change to continue. I think in our region, the regulation is actually moving more favorably towards our industry, so custody providers, because a large part of the assets historically have been maintained with brokers. And unlike um, developed economies where regulation actually causes more expense to, to, to the custody industry, it's really driving actually more business towards um, to, towards the custody participants in the region. Um, I expect that regulatory change to continue and I expect as a result of the current crisis, um, new regulation to be implemented, but I think it's perhaps still at an early stage for regulatory change in that particular regard. Okay, anyone else? If I may also add, so from our region point of view, we have currently two regulations that are really on top of our agenda. So SRD2, which came into force in, in September, is already a regulation implemented and everyone needs to comply with it in a different way. And I think here the industry faced the numerous challenges in the past weeks in order to make sure that we fully compliant with the regulations. The other one is CSDR, which has been postponed to 2022, but still, uh, we still do not have too much time left, even if it is one year ahead of us. Uh, it is a very, very complex project, uh, whereby we need to ensure that we do the necessary enhancement, even if we are in a virtual environment. Uh, and this also requires a huge collaboration between the industry participants, because uh, it cannot be that only one part of the, the chain is ready, while the other market participants are not ready. And we are facing this situation, unfortunately, that in many cases, uh, some of the infrastructures are not able to provide the required data which we need as a subcustodian implement and then our clients need to also implement at the end which might be out of EU so this is a, lo a long chain which requires a, a lot of collaboration uh, across end-to-end um, -end the value chain. I'm also expecting that regulation uh, will come further uh, further strengthening also the efficiency or improving the efficiency because all these regulations are aiming to harmonize and streamline the process this application flow, which is the aim of the industry in order to be much more efficient. So I'm absolutely welcoming these initiatives. These are challenging to implement, but at the end of the day, this is bringing to the entire value chain a big efficiency and big value. Um, so here, what I would rather expect is a, a more or a different solution from the regulators when implementing new regulations, taking into account the current uh, uh, pandemic situation. So how to make sure that uh, paper-based uh, uh, processes can be em uh, eliminated in the future in a very, very secure way. So there are ways already, I think, uh, there are providers already out that needs to be uh, assessed and also regulation needs to be adjusted to that. Uh, and I think this is the direction I'm expecting the regulators go, uh, but not easing, uh, not easing the controls, rather strengthening the controls, but maybe in a different way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I, th I think we're reaching the conclusion. Uh, is there anything anybody would like to add on, on some of the other, other subjects we've, we've covered uh, before we close it up? Well, I think perhaps just uh, for me uh, uh, a closing comment. I think we have to we have to remember that we have a responsibility as financial institutions um, towards I think both the, the people that work within our banks. I think mental mental health is incredibly important in these times when when there are vulnerable people who are being forced to work at home. And I think it's it's our responsibility to make sure. And I, I'm I know that SOCGEN are doing this, and I'm sure that within um, uh, the different institutions that we interact with are doing everything they can to to make sure that people don't feel isolated the staff don't feel isolated um because these are very challenging times and we yeah we don't know what uh, what people's living situations are at home and, and 
Um, and it's important, I think, to provide options um, for, for people to work collectively, um, whether that's from an office or um, from a decentralized office, um, you know, VCP sites, just to give just to give staff um, and people the op op opportunity to do that. Um, you, may, you may be uh, in, in a vulnerable situation. Okay. All right, anyone else? We'll just add the comment that, uh, you know, I think that out of this crisis, um, clearly it's moved towards remote working practices. The use of technology has increased dramatically. But at the end of the day, you know, we are still very much a people driven business and people are the very heart of our industry. That's what has, 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 has developed the creative and innovative products that we as an industry have produced over a long period of time. Uh, I just think it's 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 going to be um, critical for us to identify a way that we can maintain that personal touch and that individual contact between participants in in the changing environment that we have uh, and i think that, that that is going to be one thing which i think we all need to work on post this given that the dramatic shifts and changes that we're seeing as a result of this for working practices okay all right. If I may also just just add uh, what Stuart was saying, I think it's very important comment that he made that we all in the industry, as well as the culture of the company, will define how certain uh, companies will further develop here, and we need to support our people, our clients, our colleagues uh, in this very difficult, uh, challenging environment, not to feel isolated, as, as Stuart was saying, and here the communication uh, internal and communication with the colleagues and the clients uh, is something very, very important uh, nowadays. Okay. I mean, just to wrap it up, maybe I, I'll just I echo all what you guys said. It's true. Because at the end of the day, we got to keep our, uh, our team members engaged, our clients informed, and we got to do a lot more to stay connected and, and people are engaged as we get through this because this is definitely... Business as unusual times, as people call it, but we have to make it business as usual to be the new norm as we move. All right, well put. Um, I want to thank Julia, Stuart, Lloyd, and Kashif for giving us your time and the benefit of your knowledge and experience. I hope you and all of our viewers stay well. All right, thank you and goodbye.